Good evening, everyone. I'm Joe Newmeyer, film critic for WOR Radio. And let's have a huge round of applause, please, for Never Look Away. And now, please join me in welcoming writer, director, and producer Florian Henkel von Donnersmark. Thank you very much. Welcome, Florian, and congratulations on the film, which has, by the way, just been nominated for two Academy Awards for Best Foreign Language Film and Best Cinematography. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So there's so much to talk about with this amazing film. Um, there's obviously the idea of the creative process, legacy and art, and the meta and micro effects of evil. Let's start off by talking about how you approach kind of the layering of uh, artist Gerhard Richter's life and art into the narrative and themes that you wanted to address. Uh, you know, in a way, the, it, it was the initial idea had to do with Gerhard Richter's life. I'd been looking for a long time somehow for a story that would tell the st uh, you know, the something about the creative process, as you say. You know, I, I, I had this idea that I'd find it in the world of opera. Uh, I, I thought, you know, uh, I'd take one of my favorite operas and then maybe find something out about how that story came about. I, I thought that it would be, you know, a composer who, you know, suffered all the problems that everybody suffers in life, you know, problems in love and health and finances or whatever, and then he goes, uh, you know, fr from his terrible little life, he goes back to his room and, and sets it all into these incredible arias, and then you'd find it again on the big opera stage and, you know, in this beautifully transformed way. And I, th I but... I looked through all of uh, my favorite operas, and it was always pretty much the same story that, uh, you know, just a composer who needed money and set a bestseller to music, you know? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there was never anything. It was just sent a libretto and just wrote the notes. Uh, so I, I didn't find any of that personal connection there that I was looking for. And then uh, through uh, through an uh, first an article and then a book that a... a, a the celebrated journalist in uh, in Germany wrote, uh, who normally doesn't write about art at all. Um, he'd done a um, he he found out something about Gerhard Richter that I thought was really interesting. So uh, Gerhard Richter, I didn't I hadn't known that much about him to be uh, honest. Uh, I I knew of a few of his paintings that are um, a l kind of almost like political icons a little bit in G in Germany. And uh, one was a painting of that was a copied photograph, copied in painting of a mm, beautiful young <coughs> woman who was holding a little child. And uh, and and first he released it as mother and child, and then later revealed. He kind of always reveals his life in pieces, and then kind of retracts and you know confirms and so on. He's he's kind of half guarded about his life in a really interesting way. And then he revealed that this was uh, he as a little child with his mother's youngest sister, who was murdered by the Nazis uh, because she was schizophrenic. And then, actually, this journalist who, I mean, interestingly, Richter did not become world famous until, I mean, he was pretty well known in Germany, um, but he didn't become world famous and his prices, you know, were only became what they are after a show here in New York in 2002 that uh, that the Museum of Modern Art did. It was, uh, it was I think it was called like 40 Years of Painting or something like that. And it showed suddenly that here was someone who'd just constantly been producing really interesting uh, uh, things. And so there was a renewed interest in him in Germany also. And this great journalist took it on to research his background and, uh, and found out that the um, what Richter did not know, that um, the father of the woman that Richter ended up marrying um, was a high-ranking SS doctor who'd managed to escape uh, justice and had actually only died in the 80s. Uh, I think he, you know, he was over 90 years old at that point and um, had never been brought to justice. And the interesting thing is, you know, Richter really didn't know and could plausibly present that. And um, But if you look at Richter's work, you almost think he, you know, like uh, if he didn't know it on a conscious level, at least he knew it on a subconscious level because it's all there. Like why would you take a boring photograph of um, this father-in-law at the beach um, a photo and, and turn it into a painting, uh, not even a particularly beautiful one, but a very powerful one if you look at it. Why would you do that? And, and you know, and then later you find out that was, uh, that was the exact time where he basically, um, you know, condemned to death uh, his aunt, you know? So there's, it's like if you, and there's many other of those, those overlaid portraits and all that, and I thought, 
it's really interesting. There must be such a thing as, uh, and here it becomes manifest, as uh, as the as artistic knowledge, which is not the same as complete factual knowledge. And I think that it's. Uh, I mean, it's interesting when when Gerhard Richter is asked, "What what did you think while you were painting this painting?" And you know, and he does he does very specific painting since he has that photo. I mean, not photo real technique. It's not like he wants to make it look like um, like reality uh, and uses photos, that's not what it is. He wants to make it look like a photo. Uh, but he's asked then, okay, what were you thinking when you were, I don't know, painting this image of the Twin Towers or something like that? And then he says, uh, I, I wasn't thinking, I was painting. And I don't think that he says that to be flip. I think what he means is that you can solve a problem by thinking. Mostly you can't solve it by thinking. But you could also solve it by uh, just painting and through art, and in a way, you might get a lot further um, uh, that way if you really trust your instinct and your sensory apparatus. And so I thought it would be interesting to just take that as a starting point for the film. In fact, there's a later question I have, but let's jump into it right now, is that idea that sort of there almost there's, there's like a meta sense that kind of is going on, that's sort of an artistic sort of parallel. And, and we see it uh, so starkly drawn in the scene where he walks into the to the office where his aunt was, and he, he looks to that corner and he feels something was yeah. in that corner. You know, it's a it's an artistic you know kind of pull in some ways. Yeah. But there's also obviously all the other parallels in the sense that you know when he says I do it because I can, which is obviously something that also that the major says. And there's there's all of these kind of constant overlays that kind of work in sort of a, a sensual sort of sensate way, right? Yes, yes, and I, I mean I think that I I I believe that very much, and you know I've um, I think that. You know, when people say that they have supernatural powers, I don't think what it is. That's I don't think there really is uh, that. But I think that I it's pretty much the same thing. If you are extremely sensitive and really trust your intuition and let that happen, you know, I think that theoretically, you know, when people come into a room and know what's happened there, you know, I I I've seen people do that. But you know, if you think about the number of choices that there are that the people who live in that place made, um, maybe a knowledge of what happened there, like even just the choice of furniture or where they arranged it, you know, that conveys information too, right? So in a way, you can decode um, everything. I mean, that's how people, you know, I mean, sometimes part of it is what we, what we do um, in, uh, uh, in, in, in life every day. You know, we look at someone's face and that face tells us almost everything that they've, that they've been through, yeah. you, you can even tell by just looking at someone whether that person is a liar or not. You know, I mean, th that's all in there. That's not some supernatural intuition. It's because things leave traces. And, uh, and theoretically, I think you could go into, if you, gave, if you gave someone, you know, I don't know, one little picture to hang up in a completely bare room, and you gave him a, you know, just a hammer and a nail, I think just from where that person decides to hammer the nail, just because there is an infinite number of choices, even that could probably tell you everything you needed to know about that person. Like you know, it's it's there is much more information around us than we uh, than we're willing to acknowledge. And then to, to pivot off that, the idea that's that's presented in the very first scene of the film, when the when the guard at the degenerate art exhibit is talking about, in some ways, that if art is I not fitting now with the with whatever the the prevailing uh, uh, winds are in terms of politics or in terms of social structure, uh, the art is now deemed bad where it was deemed good, and that sort of. But there is that. But obviously, we're watching it, and we're knowing that art doesn't have that. Art is the truth, and art art is not what's pivoting. It's the it's the senses around it that are pivoting. It's the view of it that's pivoting, right? Yes, but you know, I mean, it's not because we don't happen to have um, you know a dominant ideology enforced by some authoritarian government that there isn't an ideology which is keeping people from making real art. You know, because there's always, I mean, there's always the dominance of of fashion. Of there's always you know of the market. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, you know, at first, when Kurt arrives in the West, he's so used to being told by the system what to do that, in a way, he's looking to, well, well wait, what does this system tell me to do, you know? And, uh, and, and only when he throws that overboard and realizes he can only find the truth within, however strange or however obvious it is or however much he uses the very things that he learned in the other, um, in the other context, you know, that is the only way to go. So uh, I think that... You know, we w we shouldn't be too sure that we're not 
um, you know, I mean, political correctness, which is so prevalent in um, in art, um, in films, you know, it, that's it's a real problem because if 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 people are you know put on blinkers too much because of some because of what might be perceived as you know offensive, um, then it, it, it can be um, you know it, it, it can it can lead to problems in art. Now it may solve some societal problems, but I don't think that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a risky territory, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. We're going to take some audience questions in just one moment, but I want to just uh, spin off that to, to the, uh, uh, what the art teacher says at the school is based on Joseph Boys and kind of that sense of when he recognizes that this is not him, when he gives that amazing soliloquy about that the r only real things he ever felt was grease and oil, and he can recognize Kurt's art and say, that is not you. Um, there is that sense of he's being able to see through another sense of another example of that sort of sense of I can see this and this is not you, right? Yeah. yeah. Although you know it, it, he's kind of he's in a way not being true to something he said before, which is you know only you right. uh, can know what's true for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? It's not entirely like that. I mean, I, I it, it, there's some truth in that, but there's also truth in the exact opposite. Uh, you know, it, it, because. I, I experienced that very much in you know in the time that I spent with Richter where I asked him to show me uh, the you know also the original photographs from which he made these paintings and they are very boring just family photographs from family albums you know that you'd you'd have your great aunt show you and you kind of hope she wouldn't you know <laughs> um, and 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 they're really not not special yeah. and then he takes these photographs and he paints them. And you know, if there's a crease in the photograph, he'll paint the crease. You know, I mean, it's like really, he will truly he sees his process as photography, yeah. Yeah, uh, and and it, it will be startlingly similar, yeah. except that he uh, it does that sfumato thing where he uh, uh, blurs it a little bit, um, and um, and then, but suddenly, because suddenly the painting, and it's not a size thing. Um, Maybe a little bit, but not mainly. You know, it, 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 it suddenly this image becomes so powerful, and I think it's there is something that I it almost makes visible the mysterious process of art, which is that if something is channeled and filtered through what you truly feel, it, 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 that power somehow makes it into the work of art. And I mean, I don't think I I, I don't know if I. I don't know why that is, yeah. you know. Um, I, I really don't. I mean, I think that might be stay forever mysterious. But it's never been so clear to me as when he showed me the um, the photographs and I saw the painting uh, uh, next to it. You know, it was suddenly e through every single brushstroke, everything that he felt made it onto the canvas. So much so that he can go into a press conference and lie about it yeah. um, and trust the fact that these that the the artistic spark will still jump. To you know, kind of fly into the hearts of the of the uh, uh, of the art critics writing about it. They'll say, well, you know, it's obviously not about anything that has to do with him, but for some reason, it's really powerful. Right. You know, so he does not even need the factual information because he's come to trust uh, his 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 in yeah. his. Yeah inner voice. Yeah, that he's communicating with people. Um, and let us also then obviously talk about the, the other character who obviously is a, there's lots of things going on, and including in your first film, The Lives of Others, there's a sense of, uh, which is set in the early 80s in East Germany, the character of Professor Siebed has got so much going on and, and so much sort of political and historical weight, but there's also this sort of sense of, of, of the legacy and the influence of of evil or the or the duplicity that's that's happening in in forces we're not even sort of prepared for. What was going on in your writing of that character and and layering him into the into the script? Um, yeah, it's. I'll tell you kind of one thing that really helped me, I think, research this and look at this whole period in a fresh way because I mean, so much has been done on that whole, um, you know, on the on those twelve awful years in which the greatest crimes in the history of mankind were committed. Um, uh, so much has been done, and I think very often these things uh, go into caricature a little bit, and I think it's a real problem, because if you portray these things as too obviously repulsive and evil, um, you know, in a way, uh, then, then oh, oh, uh, you know, any work of art or you know, or any book, film, movie, painting that would show it like that does will never help to contribute to that not happening again, because you have to show, uh, and I think that's, you know, very much uh, 
all of our mission, but you know, especially me as a German, you know, I, I, I we have the responsibility to kind of you know be um, be guardians that really warn of the slightest trace of that ever happening again, you know, um, and so you know, I really w one thing that I remembered at and y because you know, if it were as crass and as extreme and as obviously disgusting, repulsive evil as it is shown in so often in movies and, and, and books and cartoons and whatever, you know, then then everybody would have been in the resistance. You know, it's not as if, the one thing that we shouldn't forget is, um, you know, compassion is a human instinct. It's not a virtue, you know. It's something, you know, it, you know n no one, uh, you know, wants to see, uh, you know, uh, a child harmed, you know, or something like that. You know, it, it's it, it's you, it, uh, or at least most people, you know, 99.9% .9 of people who would see something like that would recoil at that immediately, not because they're virtuous, because it's just that's how human beings are built. So you have to see how does the seduction of evil work, you know, and that's something, you know, how does it disguise itself? What 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 other trappings does it use? You know, that that's I think that's really important. And also one other thing that. Um, was always very important to me, something that changed the way that I look at mm, history altogether, was something that my grandparents always told me. They said, never believe, you know, in a way that the Nazi era was just used by people as an opportunity to do evil. The people who were assholes in those 12 years, from 1933 to 1945, were assholes before 33 and were assholes after 1945. You know, it's not as if, and that's an important thing to, to, to bear in mind, and it really helped me in my research to this and to say, you know, where did that monstrosity and that evil and where did all that go? It doesn't suddenly disappear just because you don't have the chance to do that, yeah. you know? Um, and, uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, th that's what I was also looking to show in a way, how does this person continue to, to um, you know, to destroy lives um, even after he that particular power to destroy lives had been taken from him? Even just uh, glancingly, the we see him in one scene, but Franz, the the first doctor who who recommends obviously that Elizabeth uh, go to get sterilized. That's sort of you can see how easily that slip slide is from he was an asshole pre thirty three, and now there's sort of this other sort of sense of I've got a mission to do, and I'm we doctors are in charge of hereditary health kind of oh thing. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, that's completely. I mean, if you look at you know two groups in Germany in particular, which was doctors and teachers, they really, I mean, I I have awful, awful track record in, in that time. And I, I think it has something to do with the fact that these are people who are, you know, <coughs> used to a bizarre type of power. And it takes a lot of strength of character and not to then be seduced by suddenly, oh, here's that much more power, you know, to be given to you. Like you've had that taste of, you know, um, of the total power that teachers have over children, you know, of the total power that doctors have over their patients, you know, and now you're given the sweet nectar of that much more power and it was very hard to resist for most of them. But, you know, but the thing is, you know, I, I, I really, um, I, I, I really think, um, you know, one thing that I've come to uh, value uh, very much in in this country, I in the United States, and you know, and I, I spent uh, many years of my childhood here. And um, uh, my father was an executive with Lufthansa German Airlines. We were actually in 1975 the first family to live on Roosevelt Island um, when that was founded. Uh, we lived there for six years until he was transferred back to Berlin, and um, s and it was. And uh, actually, two of our oldest friends, uh, Jim Friedlich and Melissa Stern, an artist and a, uh, a, a, j a journalist, are here um, tonight. And you know, it is um, one thing that I've really come to value about this country, and the principle that this country is founded on is truly the belief in the individual and not in the collective. You know, and that is something. Th it's something so. One thing that really scares me always, whenever I found it for my whole life, is when suddenly, you know, there's a kind of group think, um, and people just uh, think one thing. People get on board because it's opportune, and suddenly they don't know if they believe that just because it's useful for them or because they really believe it. And in a way, they're giving up their soul and their character. And I think that somehow the the very structure of America, with you know its insistence on the individual, on self-reliance, on not 
having the government involved everywhere on uh, you know um, even the messiness that it brings with it you know it is because of I, I really think that certain things are not possible here and um, and 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 I think that in a way you know um, uh, I think America and also the world should be um, a little bit careful in you know, w w I know that uh, many people are, of course, very upset about uh, uh, you know the current American government, but that's nothing in comparison to what went. It's truly nothing in comparison, and it's uh, to what went on 1933 in Germany. And when I do hear those parallels, it's 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 you know, r really, it's it's just from people who haven't looked into that. It's a totally different uh, structure. This is you know, some rudeness and crassness and unfortunate things being said and done, you know, that will be forgotten very soon um, because the texture of this country is just fundamentally different. And I think that, you know, people should never forget that I think America has a particular um, importance, I think, in guiding the world, you know, now more than ever because uh, the in a globalized society, uh, you know, that, w that we're all living in right now where suddenly everything has moved so much more closely together. Um, now, there is one people that has shown how, how to achieve that, the people of different races, backgrounds, nationalities, faiths, um, you know, uh, and so on, can live together in harmony, and that is America, and only America, you know? And yeah, it's, it's really, so, so we need, we need your, your, <laughs> your, your guidance on that, you know? So, so, so that's, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, looking into these dark chapters has made me appreciate, you know, all the more what, um, uh, you know, wha wha what this country has. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We've got a couple of microphones floating around the audience, so if anybody has a question, definitely shoot a hand up, but shoot up really high, because we've got lights right in our front. Right there, the first one went up, went up in the middle right there. The mic coming one second. Thanks very much. Oh, no, oh, there. Yep. Yes, yeah, okay, right, it's there, there you behind go. you. And, okay, <laughs> and we'll go to you after. So her, then you. Yeah, ladies first. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Um, Caleb Deschanel usually works on Hollywood productions. Was there any challenge to bring him on an international production? That's a great question. Um, so um, he was actually, so he's my favorite director of photography, b truly bar none. Um, I, I actually, when... When I was seven years old, my father took me to, uh, to one of the first films, or the very first film that I saw was uh, at the Museum of Modern Art. That was a really, uh, actually my father, you know, I think it was about five or so, and my father said, okay, now is time for you to see your first film. And he looked, you know, what had he been moved as by a child? And he'd, and there was like, uh, there was an old German silent film about Dr. Doolittle and his, and his animals. And uh, it was done like cardboard cutouts, really cute little ones. And, 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 and he, he remembered that film from his childhood. He was born in 1935. I think that film was probably from like made in 1930 or something like that. And um, then, and he took us there because the Museum of Modern Art was showing, uh, si um, was showing s silent German silent movies. Now, I don't know if he'd gotten the date wrong or if the museum had programmed a different film, what they were actually showing was Varieté, an erotic thriller, um, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, which was, you know, showed things that uh, in our family were not even <laughs> talked about. But, you know, uh, I mean, Jim and Melissa, you know my father, he'd paid his five dollars um, and there were his two little kids, five and six. And he said, well, you know, I'm going to watch this movie. Uh, so. We were there, kind of, and I was—I I remember thinking, "Wow, this is what movies are about." Uh, you know, I—I <laughs> I really I want to be involved in this. Um, and um, but then, actually, the second movie that he took me to see uh, was something more appropriate, and that was in a, an open-air uh, theater. And I, I don't know which one that was. Um, it, it was *The Black Stallion*, f Caleb's first film as a director of photography. And I really remember how that film made me understand that cinematography can be art. And since then, I've followed Caleb Deschanel every bit as much as I'd follow you know, a director. Um, so when he made Being There, or um, you know, The Natural, or The Right Stuff, or um, you know, uh, even you know, National Treasure, or um, I, I, I would go and see those films, and every time be transported by his beautiful composition, his 
his natural but still somewhat, and you can't even pinpoint exactly what it is, heightened uh, 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 lighting uh, uh, concept. And you know, and it's always so emotional. And you, you know, it's not as if he just makes one place brighter, but you still always know where to look. You know, which is uh, which is amazing. I mean, it's amazing how he guides us. And so when I had the idea for this story, and it kind of worked out the plot, but I hadn't written anything yet, I uh, I contacted Caleb Deschanel and uh, and I said, you know, can we have breakfast? I'd met him once at the academy. We'd been at a at a um, in on a committee together there, and I was kind of starstruck when I'd met him. But then I thought, okay, um, you know, can I? I'd just like to meet with you and tell you about something that I'm I, I want to write now. But I know that you know if you commit to something, it's years in advance because he really likes to prepare. And I know that you pass on most stuff, and, but I don't even have a second choice in my head. Um, so <laughs> here is you know, here's what I want to do. And I told him the whole story, which lasted you know, even longer than the movie. I think we were there for four <laughs> hours or so. Um, and he you know, just listened really attentively. And then he said, OK, you know what? This really interests me because I, I always, you know, this is what I'm th I think about all my life, you know, of what is the origin of cr human creativity. And uh, and then I said, okay, well, you know, then, you so so you'll think about it if you know if I give you the when when I've written it and you like the script. And they said, no, look, if you write exactly if you if you write what you just told me, uh, you know, um, even if you write it badly, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> you know, and it was uh, and he um, and so you know he was he, it was really it was fantastic. Um, yes, you're right. He's obviously used to productions on a grand scale. Um, and uh, and actually, he went right from doing our film. He went to doing the live action Lion King, yeah. uh, which um, uh, uh, you know. Le let's see which film will have more <laughs> viewers. <laughs> Ours or that one? <laughs> no, but I mean, he has. Um, but he. Uh, it, it was really really interesting to watch him. Uh, uh, you know, work on reinventing. A, you know. A, a a technical visual language um, that goes so far beyond, for example, John Favreau's last live-action film when he did the um, the Jungle Book. You know, yeah. but just because Caleb is someone who has such a beautiful way of thinking about images and always is guided by, you know, how can the light be more emotional yeah. and yet natural. You know, it's it's, it's really interesting, and uh, so, you know, it's uh, it kind of fit my. Um, I don't know. You know, he's he's become a very very close friend because we're just so. Um, I don't know. I feel like we have so much the same approach to so many things, of, although we're of different generations and uh, backgrounds. You know, it, it, it's just um, we agree almost on all films, on all frames, on everything. You know, it's like we always knew when the actors played. I mean, he knew even though he doesn't speak German. Uh, he knew, you know, when an acting moment was great. He has he's incredibly attuned to actors because his his wife, uh, Mary Jo Deschanel, is a wonderful actor. She was in Twin Peaks and and uh, and the right stuff, actually, right. And then uh, she w and, and his both of his daughters are um, are, are very accomplished uh, actresses. There's um, Emily Deschanel, who was uh, best known through a television series Bones, which which she did, and Zoe Deschanel, who's best known also through a television series. Interesting, al although she did interesting movies also, but it's called uh, um, the New Girl. New Girl. Uh, she's the star of that. She's the New Girl. And um, and so these, uh, you know, so he he kind of grew up with these strong women actors, and uh, and and so he has a, gr you know, he knows he knows at the end of the day all the lighting stuff and everything, you know, if if we had to shoot if we, you know, if if there was a choice, we take, you know, just um, you know, we have to take our, s you know, my second my 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 second choice actors, not terrible actors, but just my second choice actors. But keep all the trappings, um, or you know, uh, stay with the first choice actors and just have to shoot it with available light on an iPhone. You know, we w he would he would go for option B any day. You know, uh, and and he knows I would too because there's an th so there's a really wonderful focus on the actors, and I I I think that's because he uh, you know just is with these amazing actors all day, and also because one of the very few talents this man does not have is acting. He's a <laughs> terrible actor. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, people always try to put him in as an extra somewhere, but you know, he'll he'll manage to mess that up. But oh <laughs> but only that, you know, it's because he has pretty much every other talent. So he really respects actors and that's a that's a wonderful you know, just part the starting point for yeah. For 40 years, I mean, just as a side note, for 40 years, so many amazing films, and those four that you mentioned uh, right out of the gate are such an amazing quartet. There's even a lesser-known Hal Ashby film called The, the Slugger's Wife that is so – that the scenes of domesticity are really warm, and it's really it, – it, the, the warmth in the film is really – 
in the cinematography, and the, it adds so much to the relationship in that film between Rebecca Dobrone and, uh, and Michael Keaton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, a really so he's now also done a few really interesting films with um, William Friedkin. Yeah. Uh, among them, uh, the film Ki uh, Killer Joe, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. was which was um, uh, wh which is really interesting. Yeah. That that's the film that established Matthew McConaughey as a serious actor, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, and and it's a very very interesting piece yeah. of work. Yeah. So. Uh, in the case of like something like Picasso, like looking at those portrayals of women in Picasso's painting, it's like it's very it's it's difficult to separate the art from the artist in, in so many ways. Even though it's there's there's it's kind of looking at it through different prisms, you know. Yeah. Yes, I mean I think that you do have to take into account uh, always the um, let's say the the social societal yeah. context. Yeah. You know, I mean I, I I do find that it's problematic if you go back in time and suddenly say, oh, you know, this play from uh, you know, the 1950s doesn't treat yeah. women in a sufficiently respectful way, let's do away with it. You know, that, that I find, yeah. that's a problem because it's important to get a sense of how m movements work through history. And, you know, um, sexual mores are different, for example, in, um, in, in, in different countries, in different cultures, in, uh, you know, th th vastly different. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, if, if uh, you know, I mean, I think that um, in, you know, I mean, for example, something like, uh, let's say, the mm, sexual molestation of minors, or you know, a rape, um, or something like that. That has always been, um, you know, th in let's say in the in the time that, uh, I mean, that's always been something that yeah. that has been against certainly, you know, um, or you know, uh, our customs and and, and, and tradition. Yeah. Yeah, I read something res recently very interesting about when you're looking at films from the 30s or 40s or 50s, we're the time traveler, not th not the film, not yeah. the project. Yeah. You know, we are the ones who are looking at it from two different points of view. The film, in that respect, was of its time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I mean, yeah. you know, I've, I've um, s you know, th people can find that ever anywhere. You know, I mean, I, I remember like one um, uh, journalist being furious with me, like, I hate the way that this that the father treats his daughter, and I said. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I do too. She said, "You do too." Uh, I mean, you wrote this, and I said, "Well, you know, I mean, it's you know, I, I like you can't take <laughs> you can't take it so far that even the villains have to be politically correct." You know, I mean, that's like uh, that that's really taking it a step too far. You know, it c it things can be used for characterizations, but um, but you know, you have to say true true to the times, and I mean, otherwise, you know, I mean, yet you can do a fun fantasy uh, uh, thing like uh, you know. Quentin Tarantino, where people go around in the, you know, uh, um, uh, around the Civil War and just blast away racists, but that's, you know, that's more of a kind of, you know, just absurdist wish fulfillment, um, and, um, you know, the the reality is it's it takes a lot of work to try and figure out how did women, um, you know, see themselves in that time also, you know, I mean, I think, for example, the character of Ellie in this movie now I think if you woke her up in the middle of the night, you know, before she fully came to, and asked her, you know, who are you? She was trained in such a way that she would probably at first say, well, yeah, I'm Carl Seaban's daughter, you know, or Professor Seaban's daughter even, you know, because she was just, so in, in a way, the most that she can even hope for is to somehow escape his clutches somehow through uh, someone who wasn't shaped in the exact same way. You know, you can't suddenly say, oh, you know what, she's going to become uh, Louise Bourgeois, you know, um, yeah. yeah. We have time for at least about one more. If anybody has one, one to make sure. Yeah, right here. We get as many questions as we can. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Somebody has a mic already. All right, fantastic. Jump in, and then we'll come back to you. Um, I'd love to like to take it in a different direction and ask you about the depictions of art in the movie. The film opens up with a recreation of the famous degenerate art show, which there's tons of documentation about. Um, it is in fact the most visited art show in all of Western history. And then you also recreate a time at the Dusseldorf Art Academy. And I'm wondering if there was as much documentation of that, if that's based on the same kind of reality as the Degenerate Art Show, or was there more uh, artistic freedom on your part to be able to kind of um, imagine that how you imagined it would be? Mm -hmm. No, yes, that, um, you know, we're, we're pretty t true to the times there. Um, it's um, so the degenerate art show, you know, as you say, you know, a crazy successful show. I think that over two million uh, visitors uh, see that show. It traveled to, I think it was thirteen different cities, and 
uh, so, I, so the principle of this show was uh, th they went to all the German public museums, uh, Goebbels and his, his people, and uh, picked out everything that they considered uh, degenerate. So that was everything that didn't show you know, something beautiful, very representational. Um, you know, the, 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 the perfect ideal was, you know, muscular men in active poses and women just lying there beautifully. And um, so, uh, you know, everything that wasn't that was considered degenerate, was pulled out of th that. And the least um, kind of, uh, the, the least technically proficient of those were shown in this show to have people mock this and next to every work of art was the exact sum of money at a time when there was a lot of poverty in Germany that the taxpayer had paid to buy this and and uh, you know it, it it worked partially a lot of people did go there you know to mock it but also you'll find a lot of artists biographies and so on that many people and many art classes went there because it was the last opportunity <laughs> to see great art uh, and and people really went there to say goodbye to these uh, to these works. And after the after that degenerate art exhibit, they did an impromptu auction in Switzerland and sold off what could be sold off, but it wasn't very well announced, and there also wasn't a lot of money going around at that time, and so many things did not get sold, and those got just got destroyed, uh, burnt, or you know, or lost, and you know, maybe some of them w w will someday show up somewhere. Um, in, in some Nazi hideaway somewhere. And uh, so it was actually, we had, yes, some documentation. There's a wonderful curator, I the head of modern art in, um, in Los Angeles, actually, Stephanie Barron. She's the leading researcher on this. She's phenomenal and also did a really, really wonderful documentary that you can find on, on YouTube. Um, and it's, 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 it's really a just great piece uh, about the degenerate art exhibit. And we, uh, so, w but of some of these paintings, you only have little black and white images. And so we had all of our painters work with the archives of these artists to try and find out what exact paints did they use, what were the materials that they used, what kind of uh, uh, canvas and so on. And then reconstructed these paintings. Uh, so for example, the, the, the large uh, Otto Dix war cripples uh, painting, there's only a little black and white one. And it's really, you know, we had a lot of art historians come to set and they couldn't believe that it was there. And we actually have a terrible agreement with the collecting society um, that we have to, I mean, I still haven't gotten myself to do it, but we have to destroy them. Uh, so I, I have to, you know, again, burn them. Uh, and uh, and, and it's, it's really going to be quite painful because so much work and so much love went into this. But of course, you know, you don't want in 50 years time uh, someone to come upon them and say, oh, here it is, you know. Uh, and, 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 you know, they, they want to keep that clear. And I understand that. I respect that. So I, I have to, I thought, you know, maybe we could make it into some kind of a, like an action, like a performance piece, and have you know a character in character burn these works of art to bring attention to that. But then my wife said, "You're crazy. I mean, people are just going to think, oh, okay, that's where people are again. They're burning great art again, you know." Uh, and so, so that went out of the window. <laughs> um, and uh, but um, that was uh, you know. So there, we we tried to stay very true to what we could find out. We had. We had a production designer and a whole team of artists working only on that, only for that scene. Uh, so just a, a another full, f full production designer. She worked under um, our main production designer, who uh, the main production designer. She supervised everything, but um, had delegated that fully to someone who was a also a, a, a someone trained in art history. Um, and then, yeah. So for the rest, um, for the other paintings, yes, the Düsseldorf things were very true to you know, to, to the type of art that was done there. And it is actually pretty well documented also because suddenly in this little town of Dusseldorf, art was reborn in a way. Uh, I the art until the early 60s in, uh, in Dusseldorf started reinventing art. The German art was really in a, in, in a terrible state because what could you do? I mean, how do you continue after 1945 making art? Um, uh, you know, e when everything seems tainted, even what was before, because you kind of think, well, that must have led up to all this. Uh, so then along came Josef Beuys and a few others and basically said, we have to go one step further. We cannot just throw the content overboard. We have to also throw all of craft overboard. You know, let's just go, and, and, and it was, mm, 
you know, it opened the door for a lot of craziness, of course, because suddenly there was no longer the, the technical threshold. You know, in a way, I, I, this was one thing that always confused me as a child. I thought, why is it that, you know, if art and craft are two separate things, why is it that the great, art, the great artists among painters, the, you know, be it Titian or, uh, you know, I don't know, um, Degas or some, why are they also technically the most proficient? You know, how does that work? And, um, uh, uh, and Picasso for that matter, you know? And so the, um, the answer that I kind of found for myself is that if you really feel so strongly that there's something you have to say and the, and the price you have to pay for entry uh, into being allowed to say that is just becoming technically very proficient, you're gonna go through all that terrible suffering and you're gonna learn it. Um, and so that's why it would c come together. But suddenly, in in uh, in Düsseldorf, uh, you know, Boyce said, "Let's do away with all that because all that that's even that stuff might be tainted. We don't know where the Nazi germ is, you know. So let's just throw everything out." And um, and I, and it led to, you know, it led to a really interesting thing that, in a way, with contemporary art, you have to you have to open your heart a lot wider because you have nothing technical to go by. You can't say, "Oh, you know what? I'm pretty good at saying how." you know, how good, uh, you know, Piero della Francesca paints the third, you know, angel in the second row, uh, you know, uh, b b so this must be a good painting. You don't have that. You really just have to see it with your heart. And so in a way, of course, there's a lot of nonsense in contemporary art, I think, but there's also, you know, but the, 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 great, uh, the great artists are hidden among them and often go unrecognized for a very, very long time um, possibly forever, you know, um, because it just takes so much to be able to see it. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned art and craft, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But just yeah. so we found, we then found a great uh, painter uh, who had worked as Gerhard Richter's one-man factory for eight years, painting a lot of his paintings to do the paintings that uh, that that Kurt paints in the end. You mentioned art and craft just now, Florian. I just want to ask for a round of applause for the amazing cast. Okay. Yeah, Tom Schilling, Sebastian Koch, Paula Beer, they're all amazing. And ladies and gentlemen, Florian von Donner, Hengel von Donner's mark, the film Thanks. is Never Look Away. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks for your thank patience. You. And <laughs> okay, Thanks, thank you very much.